degree never get. Third degree, third degree never get. Third degree. Do it again. Do it again. Harder, harder. Third degree never get. Hi, this is Third Degree Rider and contributor Alex Aaron. The Third Degree Podcast is brought to you by Soccer 90, your source for SC Dallas, U.S. national team, and international club gear. Located in Frisco at Toyota Stadium, stop in and shop their wide variety of jerseys, scarves, and soccer equipment. North Texas SC has kicked off a new season, and the new home jersey is on sale now exclusively on Soccer90.com. Pre-order yours while supplies last. Third Degree listeners receive 20% off your order when you use promo code Third Degree at checkout. Promo code good online only, some exclusions may apply. Well, hello there, FC Dallas Curious fan. Welcome to another episode of Third Degree, the podcast. Number, please. 155. Hi, it's me, Peter, alongside my good friend, the man with the sexiest of the sexy talk, Dan Crook. That is the most bizarre introduction I've ever had. Congratulations. Well, it's not, and you know it's not, because we were just having a whole conversation about it, and you were being all blue and everything. A, it was a pretty one-sided recording. conversation you had with yourself on that. No, oh, I have a feeling people really want to know what it was about, but we can't share because this is a family podcast. And uh, your hero, my hero, everybody's hero, the not-so-sexy talker, Buzz hmm. Carrick. Wow. Uh, Peter, by the way, I appreciate that when we do the number of the podcast that you don't rub in the fact that you guys are at like 290 on the kick around. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> <laughs> Why would I do that? No, I don't. I just, you know, you, longest running show in town or something. Uh, uh, no, yeah. good Lord, it's not. I mean, compared to some of those other shows on the ticket, we're fractional. Oh, no, no, no. Soccer, guys, soccer so. though. Soccer show. Soccer oh, show. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, we've been doing it since 2014. I know. I'm jealous. Uh, Peter, please uh, don't dunk on yourself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what does that mean? Does that mean I'm well, self-promoting? By, yeah. by showing off the number of a show that you're on with compared to another thing that you're on, <laughs> it would be kind of weird to be like, yeah, yeah have that why would I do? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> why would I do that? I wouldn't want to do that. Yeah, These are two different things in my life that just only vaguely cross streams every once in a while. Uh, guys, it is a week off for uh, High and Mighty Football Club Dallas, and uh, all of our attentions have been uh, focused on other things, at least mine has, including the national team, which uh, will now play in a mere two hours. And I'm assuming all things going well, meaning they don't lose by more than six goals. Uh, the United States will qualify for Cutter, which will be a tremendous thing. But I got to tell you, this one, this time, and I think I was doing this with Andy the other day, I believe this is my seventh kind of like soccer conscious World Cup qualifying cycle in my life. Seventh. I think that's right. But this is the first time I actually have players that are critical to the success of this team from my home club and that to me is probably the coolest part about this did we not have players involved in this before chad deering he didn't come uh, chad, till after but, did he but, but but yeah chad didn't yeah. make it to dallas until after i mean chad, chad yeah. and jeff were from dallas but they weren't yeah, playing Agus, yeah. for Dallas, Jeff yeah. Agus, right? And after, other than that, that you know, Jason Christ never got in the team. He had that weird tweener problem. Yeah. Um, and there really wasn't anybody else from the burn. You know, Dodd had that one weird friendly couple of opportunities, but never yeah. had anything to do with qualifying. And we would watch all those Galaxy and DC United and et cetera players get all the glory for MLS Association. And we'd all sit around and twiddle our thumbs and wonder if we'd ever dream to see the day. But here we are with multiple players all tied not just to the club, but through the academy, Dallas kids specifically themselves. And in the case of uh, the last game against Panama, Jesus and uh, Areola both score. And how tremendous is that? That's so cool. Oh, it's very cool. Uh, yeah, uh, it's the kind of the, there's a level of engagement when you have players that you're excited about that you uh, are cheering for in the national team picture that that sort of you know relate back to the team you're you're looking for. 
Uh, and, and as I say that, it just popped into my head that Kenny Cooper and Drew Moore were both involved, I think, with the national team when they played for SC Dallas a little bit. But I don't know if that – you may be right Not on qualifying. Not through qualifying. So I, yeah, yeah, I think that's, no. uh-uh. that's what I'm, I've, I've been trying to think of who you could – going all the way back to the 90 – Italy as, as far back as I can remember watching qualification process. Um, I think you're right. I mean, this is, that's remarkable, really, isn't it? It's almost – it almost speaks, I think, a lot to the idea, and a lot of people may not know this, that in the early days of the league, you, you certainly know this, Peter, that um, you know national team players were allocated to franchises, and, and FC Dallas, at the time the Dallas Burn, did not have an owner. They were owned by the league. So a lot of times there wasn't somebody speaking up for them in terms of the national team players. And like I remember our fan base complaining a lot about the fact that we didn't have one. And it wasn't until after the collapse in 98 that, um, if I remember the timeline correctly, that Chad Deering got allocated to the burn after that World Cup and then didn't really factor for the U.S. after that going forward. But he was the first guy that we had that I remember being involved in the U.S. team at all. Um, yeah, so like the early days of the burn, there really was nobody. No, <laughs> and, there and, wasn't. And now it's it's amazing now because and Dan Hunt even talks about how proud they are that really like if you care about the national team now, it's like FC Dallas is a pipeline. It's like there were two in this game, but there have been games literally where there were five or six guys that were in the t- roster that were Dallas related in some capacity. And if you go down the ranks of the national teams, you know, for a couple of tiers, the 23s and the 20s, and over the last five or six years, there's been even more guys that aren't quite in the senior team now. And there's some more that are down the pipeline even further. So, um, man, it's crazy. It, it definitely changes, as you say. It changes the way you watch, for me it does anyway, the national team oh, when there's yeah. guys that you're like, oh, can that guy get in the game? That'd be exciting, you know. I w- well, I told you last podcast, I was a complete bag of nerves over that game. But when <laughs> you were but to see, but to see Jesus and Ariola both score in that game just was like a whole like cherry and frosting and whipped cream, all of it and sprinkles and jimmies and the whole bit, all of it, all the toppings. It was so awesome to have guys from my club and I, you know what I mean, our club. My local MLS team that I've been supporting for 25 years be critical components to that, and I, and and so I wonder, Dan, has Luton Town ever had like a key player playing for England, in in the same way, in your um, lifetime? Not in my lifetime. No, uh, there was some good success in the 80s, but yeah. Um, you know, it's always been dominated by those big clubs. Uh, I think you'd have to go back to the oldest living goalkeeper to ever play for England, which is Ron <laughs> Bainham, who is 91, I believe. He was, is he still uh, alive? That's what makes him the oldest living <laughs> Oh, goalkeeper. sorry, I yeah. missed that part. Right, okay. Uh, yeah, the, the living part is very crucial to that. Your form of English is very foreign and weird to me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, by the way, uh, speaking of teammates scoring, Peter, I don't know if you saw the Otto Jack tweet that uh, uh, Jesus and Ariola are the first pair of teammates to score since 2008 in the same game. Yeah. You know, it was Fulham. It was, again, a Texas Dempsey connection. Clint and Dempsey McBride. and Eddie Johnson. Eddie Johnson. And Eddie Johnson. That's Another burn guy. I'd love to see what the, uh, the last pair from an MLS team before was. If there was. I don't know if there was. I don't know if there ever has been a pair of like active, current, active players from the same club that scored in a national, at least a, an important or a, a game that counted. Maybe there's been a friendly or something, but oh, surely the Galaxy when they had like 15 national team players did. Yeah, right. I mean, I would I would have thought that would be the one. I know I'm reminded all the time that there's all these new fans of the team that are that totally are um, excluded from all of these experiences we had 20 something years ago where we all sat around and felt like <laughs> yeah. like unwanted stepchildren oh, yeah. uh, when everybody was getting players and we were, you know, getting, uh, good Lord, it's so bad to you remember. That's so funny. So it's so different today. And it's, it's, and you know, like you said, Buzz, I mean, there are certain games through this qualifying cycle where if you were to count players like Zimmerman or uh, or uh, Weston, you know, players that don't currently play for Dallas but clearly had Dallas ties, there yeah. were times where there were five or not just on the roster, but on the field at the same time, five or six players. It was crazy. Yeah, I remember talking to somebody with Dallas, I can't remember who it was, about the idea that 
dude, there are six FC Dallas Academy players in camp right now. You have got to get a picture of that, you know, for some, you know, whatever socials or whatever. I was like, it, it's just remarkable the amount of production and it, it'll be, it'll be interesting. I think, uh, this is how the cynical part of my brain works, I guess, actually, that if we're going to look back on this era of FC Dallas as like a golden homegrown national team era, like will Dallas be able to replicate this in the future? Cause there's no guarantees that they will, you know, it's like this Paxton, Jesus, Brandon, Tanner, Tessman, Dante Seeley, you know, you can go on even back to people like a long time ago, Drew Moore, Kenny Cooper, but like there's been like this 10, maybe even to 15 year run where Academy guys from, from Kellen maybe was the first real one being an Academy guy through to now of these guys being in the pool. And like, how long can they continue to do that? I mean, Texas has always been a hotbed of course for talent. North Texas has. Oh yeah. yeah. And uh, again, uh, not to beat a dead horse, but that's why the hunts kept Dallas and sold off Kansas city and Columbus. Yeah. They knew where they knew where the, the soccer cash was um, and the soccer pool uh, existed. But, you know, you not to jump too far ahead to Dallas Cup stuff, but you tweeted a tweet uh, the other day that I just completely blew my mind about the 19 team they're about to put out there and the reality of the players that 19 team is now missing because they sold them. Yeah, yeah, it's a ridiculous list. And, and that's literally, that's exa- that's only one particular year uh, or a year and a two, half maybe of 2003s and 2004s, which are the guys now. And it's within one class, Pepe, Che, Dante, Seeley, Jonathan Gomez, who's just now breaking through to like the U-20s and stuff. You know, uh, Antonio Carrera, who's the new keeper they just signed. You know, th- there's a chunk of guys that are missing from that team that like, if you, that, that's literally like seven dudes that are missing from that U-19 team that could go back and play. And, and people wonder why, you know, there's a, Oh, how come 19 don't win any games? Dude, Cause they got seven pros missing from that team. <laughs> it's like, you know, <laughs> some of them are out there playing, starting for the national team. And you're wondering why they're not winning. The 19s don't win as many games as they used to. It's like, dude, don't be ridiculous. Right. You or know. they're playing in, in the Bundesliga. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They've gone to Germany. I mean, you know, yeah, it is a weird time. It absolutely is. Uh, but uh, Dan, will you watch the U S game tonight against Costa Rica? Will you actually watch it? I might catch the highlights, but uh, no, I'm, I've got a pretty packed schedule, unfortunately. Is it filled with sexy talk? <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> uh, it's uh, filled with uh, small businessy stuff. <laughs> that sounds so vague and generic. <laughs> Yeah, everybody on this podcast, Peter, has multiple gigs and grinds and trying to get things going. Yeah, I know. Yeah, we all do. Yeah, Uh, modern media. uh, Welcome to it. Yeah. (laughs) Okay, so Buzz, what's funny is, is despite the fact that there have been no actual games, the world of FC Dallas continues to spin, and there have been practices and surprise scrimmages, and you actually attended one last Friday. Yes, uh, that that was pretty exciting because. uh, last week, not this week, but last week, you guys, you guys remember I went to Wednesday training and I just sort of asked on the side uh, quietly of coach uh, Estevez, if there was going to be an inner squad scrimmage over the weekend, because often when they're off, they have a inner squad scrimmage. It's fairly typical. And he said, you know, maybe Friday, uh, you know, and I double checked that Friday was open. So I, you know, he didn't tell anybody else and make it, a, or nobody else thought to ask perhaps, since, you know, there's a national team games, nobody else really was there but me. So uh, I went on Friday and it was really nice that, you know, it was um, just a 60 minute game, which is perfectly fine for a Friday when you have an off week because you're not looking to grind your team into the dust on an off week. You want to give them some time off and that kind of thing and not go completely burn out. But, um, you know, they're missing a couple of players with call ups. And so they had to call up a. U17 player whose name is Malachi Molina. So props to him for being right back for the whole 60 minute game. And they brought up one player from North Texas. His name was Andre Costa. He's the kid that's a former um, US U19 who's actually from Brazil and then has played in Spain. That that kid, I don't know if you've been paying attention to him or not. Um, but it was fun. It was good to see, you know, an even set of teams. The, this coach seems to be really heavy into balanced teams and training and not really running like a starting group and making everybody on their toes all the time and and not like the best guys versus the worst guys. So uh, it was a good scrimmage. 
Dan, does it sound like to you like it does to me that Buzz's uh, ever so slight invitation to secretive Friday scrimmage is his charm finally winning over the new coach? <laughs> yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, they probably set a little throne on top of that tower that they oh, do the stop. video stuff from <laughs> just with uh, a red carpet up the, the metal stairs and a little nameplate that says Buzz Carrick. Uh, Thank you for being the only person that ever comes out to practices anymore. <laughs> Gina comes over and hand and like fills up his ice water glass <laughs> no, and then that, throws yeah. at him. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, this is somewhat interesting. You know, they've they have a new video system that they've integrated onto a pole, which is on the other side, Dan, on the side that we usually stand on. And they have a guy who comes and shoots drone footage of like all the larger drills and sort of full field. Uh, action so that they can literally do like above angle video analysis of play to show rotation. I mean, that's incredible level of attention to detail uh, to have to shoot <laughs> shoot scrimmages with drones. Frankly, yeah. they, they started doing the drone stuff a couple of years ago, but it's good to see they've expanded it because it was really limited. Yeah, in, in what they were using it for. Well, this is, I actually talked to the guy that's doing it and he says he, he's new, uh, this kid, he used to play for SMU and he's, he's a video analysis guy. Uh, this is his first season. And, and he said that he, you know, he, he records all of the, the almost basically every session from this high angle and they, they just hover it over the field as long as it'll stay up there. And then they break down all the video and show for guys. It's just, that's an incredible level of detail. I think that's amazing. And then it falls to the ground and clunks some uh, I, under. I did ask about that. In the head or something like that. <laughs> it's, a, it's got some <laughs> auto function in it that it comes down slowly. Because I thought the same thing. It's like, what's going to drop out of the sky? I said, no, it comes down. It starts beeping and it comes down slowly. <laughs> I was like, oh, good. Doink. <laughs> yeah. Lands on <laughs> Benny's head or something. That's right. Benny Resnick is out this weekend. Just gets a... caught in his massive hair. Yeah. That's By right. the way, that kid's the new role in the Ma because. He's a black hole on the field. The ball will go to him 10 times and nine times as a turnover. And the other time it's an absolute banger into the top corner because the, the dude is, I, I can't quite figure him out. So I really don't want him to play because of the fact that it would drive me nuts. Like Roland Lamont drove me nuts, except for the fact that if you get him in there, he's actually got a decent chance to score a goal. So it's very confusing. Player. So the so but Benny is signed to a deal, right? Didn't they sign him yeah. a homegrown deal? He's a homegrown signing, and and to be brutally honest, it was a bit of a head scratcher of a signing to me. That's not one I was expecting. I didn't think you know a North Texas deal. I would thought would have been fine with. He's on a full homegrown deal, and he missed all of last year, so it's not really fair to assess him like right at this minute. But um, you know, I don't see a guy that I think is ready for Major League Soccer. You know. You, you watch him scrimmage for 60 minutes and like nothing good is happening except for the fact that he scored like this 30 yard screamer into the top corner. So he's kind of a player that's hard to get my mind around him, but, but why did they sign him to a homegrown deal? What didn't we all have this weird suspicion that they, that he had some eye on Europe or something at one point? Yeah. I mean, he does he have had passports or something. He has a, yeah. He has a Bosnian passport, but which doesn't really help him with the EU. I don't think, um, you know, at the same time, they saw him Colin Smith, too, to a homegrown deal. Colin's a player I think has potential as well, but he's spent every minute of every since then with North Texas. That one's even weirder, even though I like him and I think he's got potential and I'm, I'm glad they signed him. It's another guy I thought should have been a North Texas signing. So those two guys didn't make any sense to me. Maybe it has something to do with what I've talked about where there's like this, once the O3s are all gone, there's, there was this little bit of an O4 drought and they felt like they just needed bodies or something. I, I really have never understood that. And if you certainly, if you ask about those players, you'll get a line about, Oh, Oh, we think they've got potential. And there's a future there. We want to develop them. I mean, it's the same stuff. I, I just yeah. didn't feel like either one of those guys is ready for a homegrown contract specifically. And I think right now, actually you've seen, non-specific to any particular player. Like if you ask coach Estevez about Academy kids, he'll always say something along the lines of, Oh, well, we have this organizational process and we want to be, make sure players are ready to actually help us. And I think he's pushing back a little bit against the idea of these teenagers. The problem is, and this is probably, it can be a whole podcast by itself. The problem is, is if you wait for those kids to all turn 18, you're going to lose a big chunk of them because then it's too late and they're all going to be gone. So right. this is the problem that they have with North Texas in this pipeline and the idea of these hybrid deals. Maybe it's the way to go in the future. Uh, that doesn't explain why, you know, Benny's got a homegrown deal when 
I didn't think he should. They obviously did, though. I mean, in the end, that's the thing. They just decided he was worth one. Hmm. Okay. Maybe you'll play someday about, and you guys can make up your own mind about whether he's worth the deal or not. Well, I mean, if yeah. He, yeah. I mean, I, I ultimately, I don't think any of us really thought he'd end up being a Dallas player. I think we just kind of assumed at the time they thought they could turn him somewhere else and make a little money off yeah. of him. But, well, the pandemic happened. That changed a lot yeah, of things. That probably did. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so anything about the scrimmage in particular we should know tactically or highlights or moments other than a Benny banger that you mentioned? Yeah, there's two things that jumped out of me from the scrimmage other than uh, Malachi, who's the 17, U-17 player. I mean, it's a 15 year old kid basically running around out there, which is nice for him. Um, is uh, Joe Sway, and and by the way, that's Quinones. That's the way everyone pronounces it, either Yo Sway or Joe Sway, depending on how good your Spanish is. Um, he's the the kid from uh, Ecuador, the center back, ostensibly. The interesting thing about him is that he moves really well. Uh, he obviously is still trying to figure out the system and how to play with everybody around him. Every game, he looks every scrimmage, every session, he looks more comfortable. But he moves good enough, and they've I've seen they've I've seen them use him at right back, so you can mix him into that idea of potentially being a piece you could use at right back. There's been extended runs where he's been in that position. Uh, he definitely is already ahead of um, uh, Lucas Bartlett, who's the draft pick. He's already ahead of that guy for sure. So some positive signs there with him. I I, I think it's going to be uh, Cunyones. I think is going to be a player that will need a little more time to pick up this system because he is really young and experienced. He plays, I talked to coach Estevez about him and he remarked that the, the system he came out on is very different than the one he's going to be asked to play here. And so they, mm-hmm. uh, they, that was a hint to me anyway, to be patient with his adjustment. But as I said, he's already had a Bartlett. So really it's only like, is he good enough that he'll be eventually pass up uh, Nikosi, you know, or start pushing for minutes. And, and that's the question, which we'll find out over time. But um, there's a lot of nice tools there, actually, even though he's a tiny bit shorter than I would like. Uh, I really like what I see so far. Okay. Any other notes uh, about the scrimmage before we move on to the next topic at hand? Yeah. The other thing was um, I was, I was watching specifically because I wrote the thing about Edwin. So I was watching him specifically and I was watching Faco specifically play Facundo Quinon uh, and, um, there really is some noticeable, simple things that uh, Faco does, some anticipation things where like he moves at just the right time to get in position to turn a play without having to actually tackle somebody, or he can feel pressure coming that Edwin doesn't feel. And, and those ideas really struck me in terms of Edwin's next progression. And that's what I wrote about as the future for him is those feel moments of being able to sense around you the game's flow and be able to alter that flow and Faco does some of those things, and you can see them happening in the scrimmage. I don't think that he's pushing – he's pushing Edwin in the sense of that he's a pretty solid player, but Edwin has clearly won that job. I don't think Faco's in danger of getting it back. It's just you can see these noticeable differences, and you hope that he's willing to pass some of them off to Edwin you know, or if Edwin can soak some of them up because you, you can see that shortcoming in Edwin as good as he's playing and as great a season he's playing – uh, that's the, the next thing he needs. Uh, okay. So that was all Friday, but then you went back to practice this week, buzz, uh, today's Wednesday. So you went what yesterday, Tuesday. Tuesday. Yeah. Tuesday. Did they close practice today since the yep. game is Saturday? Yeah. It's back to normal schedule of Wednesday closed. Uh, no, so no, I just got my back one... to the new normal. The new, yeah. The new normal. Yeah. The new post pandemic, normal. the new Nico normal, uh, what a drag anyway. Um, so, as part of the idea that Quinones is playing well, Bartlett is now with North Texas, um, and he was all week, as far as I know. I'm pretty sure he's going to play for them some. I, I did talk to Coach about Bartlett, and he said, you know, they, they obviously are interested in getting him a lot of minutes and games. I took that to mean potentially he might play with them for a fair bit in order to get those games, uh, and we can talk about center backs with that team later when we talk about North Texas. Um and the, the other two interesting things from a developmental perspective is there's a U19 keeper who's actually also a U17 by age. We've talked about the weirdness in the academy right now a bunch of times. His name is Aaron Salinas. So he's been in camp for a week and a half as a fourth keeper, which is interesting because he's not, for me, he's just a tick behind uh, Carrera or Julian Iso in terms of his potential. But I do think he's quite good. Uh, and for him to be invited to stick around in first team training is pretty telling. And then um, through all the processes of like, because they're missing some pieces, they need extra bodies. So this time they brought up uh, Kamungo from North Texas, who's the kid from 
uh, as an Amarillo, the high school kid. Oh, yeah, yeah, Yeah. yeah, Abilene. Abilene, thank you, who was just playing high school ball that Eric Quill was so pissed off that no one had bothered to get him to a better team. Yeah, Bernie, everyone likes to call him instead of Bernard, which I think is funny. But, you know, he was in training, and so um, all that translated to a a really interesting drill because uh, because he was in there and because they were missing Shun and they're missing Areola and because Alan Velasco just got here and they have – you know, guys like Khalil that are trying to progress still. A lot of the session was about uh, press triggers on wings and strikers and how you rotate the front ends. So it was fun to watch them work on those things specifically relative to the fact that they're missing, you know, one of their best wingers and their other one is brand new to get here. You know, I mean, O'Brien theoretically knows what he's doing in that regard because he's been here a while, but the other ones are all part of a learning process. So it was another point of emphasis that teams working on right now when they were missing those guys, which was cool to see. Okay, so does that give? Did you get any kind of insight as to what will happen when they play in Chicago this Saturday? Well, th- this is going to be one of the big question marks with a new coach. Is every coach is different with how quickly you can turn around a player who comes back from a national team? You know, Oscar used to complain that he those guys needed two weeks to adjust. I think it's legitimately much less of a problem for this coach because they play almost the identical system. You know, it's very, very similar. The differences are minute and the, both of those players play it in a role that's very similar. So given the fact also that they probably are only going to start one game apiece, although we did see Areola not trained today. He had sneakers on or something, right? So, yeah, I think there's a word that he was icing his groin in the second half. Yeah, of, that's entirely uh, possible. So game. yeah, yeah. You know, this is where we have the Dallas has a couple of good wings. So with that slight groin issue, why not just go with Obreon and Velasco? That's certainly fine. You know, uh, obviously the team really hinges on Jesus, though. If you don't have Jesus, you know, Frank O'Hara is always a consummate pro. And he scored a couple of actually really nice goals in the scrimmage and in training this week. You know, he's very adaptable and is a smart IQ player, even though he's slower than molasses, slower than me, which I'll tell you something. You know, so I think Jesus probably, especially if he doesn't start today, will be fit enough that he can walk in and play. Paul will probably be, you know, uh, reviewed or assessed, and then we'll see, you know, whether it's him or whether they'll go with O'Brien and Velasco instead. So otherwise, I can't possibly see any changes. This team's playing as well as it is. There's no reason to change anything. You know, there's nothing going wrong, if you will, other than the fact that two guys might not be available. But I think they will be. I think Jesus for sure should be. Okay. Well, that game is uh, Saturday. I think it's Saturday afternoon, isn't it? It's a day game this week. Hold on. Let me look this up here on the interwebs. Uh, Where's the Dallas button? There it is. There's the FC Dallas button. That game is 2.30 on Saturday in Chicago on Univision. Oh, it's the Spanish. Yes, it is the Spanish. And you probably won't get to see Shakiri because I know Shakiri's been playing uh, for Switzerland. Didn't didn't Shakiri play in the uh, England-Switzerland game the other day, Dan? Um, I don't know. I didn't actually watch it. Oh. Man, you are a busy person. Didn't watch England. Man, that's how you know Dan's busy. No, uh, no. I mean, I never watch our qualifying because we, I mean, it should be an automatic, right? Man, you're one of those fans. Hey, I know the feeling. But I think. <laughs> one of those, <laughs> those ridiculous fans. Okay, so uh, that's 2.30 on Saturday. So moving on, we did have a season opener for North Texas which brings us to uh, the segment of the podcast everybody either loves or hates, hashtag kit talk, because mm. as they removed their jackets, I assume I wasn't there. I don't know how they – you were there, Buzz. How did they debut the new jersey? They warmed up in a typical sort of blue warm-up kit that they always use, and then they just came out of the locker room. They, they, they march out and they announce their names one at a time. They all come out like in a string together, though, and uh, they just come out wearing them. So there's no there's no jacket to remove or anything. Well, okay, Dan, this is a very Dan heavy part of the podcast because you are our kit expert. Uh, Why don't you talk about this particular kit and we'll save opinions and everything for after that. Describe it for everybody who, who may not have seen it yet. 
Okay, so a couple of years ago, Tigris had a third jersey that was this white, yellow, and blue spiky, tigery, God knows whatever it was. The, a pattern that was later used by Houston, I believe, uh, on their last set of jerseys. Uh, it's that, but with... Wait, this pattern was in a Houston shirt? I think so. I don't remember this particular... Which Houston shirt was it? It was originally a Tigris one, and then they kind of made it a... You know, you can buy and have jerseys customized. So, right. uh, their Houston's 2020 jersey was, I guess it's not exact. It was kind of like a two shades of orange. Right. Okay. Very heavily inspired by, uh, it, it just looks like a cheaper version of the North Texas jersey, basically. Uh, uh, okay. But, yeah, it's, it's supposed to be like a three-tone jersey, so the... It, I guess instead of like an actual purple, it looks like a an almost maroon, like a dark red that they're kind of using as the as the off color between the uh, the red and the blue. Um, and crucially, it it continues around the back as all jerseys should. So is this a is this a bespoke shirt for North Texas, or is this something off the Adidas rack? uh n technically neither uh adidas have a a service called my team um where you can order bespoke jerseys like you could uh order them for for your team uh dallas beer guardians um you know when i was part of leadership for that you know we we ordered um from germany like red and white and then later red and blue hoop jerseys with you know blue and or white sleeves um completely yeah as i say, completely bespoke this all uh ah oh, what's the word i'm looking for uh sublimated uh you know when you when you buy them straight from them it costs about 45 dollars a jersey uh so that's what this is um my okay. team and my team you can probably actually you know you can find the website and and actually make those jerseys but uh that's one of the one of the patterns on there and I, uh, say, I, I love the execution okay. of it. Yeah, in fact, you had the super hot sports opinion that you actually think this is a better j shirt than the new FC Dallas shirt. I do. Would you like to defend that position, sir? Nothing to defend. It's a great. It's a great jersey. I, I'm not. <laughs> I'm not that big of. Um, I'm not that big a fan of the, the new FC Dallas one. I actually like the last one better. Okay. All right. Wow. Buzz, when when yeah, I'm confused by that too. But okay, whatever. Um, Buzz, what were your reactions when you saw it in person? How does it look in in action? Uh, good, good. Um, it's it's a little too uh, modernish for me. I mean, like it's a little too um, quirky, stylized for me. I like I like my jerseys a little more classic than that. Uh, but as Dan says, the panel around the back is really good. The, the colors are both dark enough that the white numbers on them really pop. Now, the white numbers and names are in the MLS Next Pro font, which is one of the stupidest fonts I've ever seen in my life. Uh, so idiotic. It's so bad. I haven't, I haven't seen it. Yeah, it's so bad, dude. It's like half know. the numbers are tilted and half of them are not. So it looks like somebody was writing in crayon, which is really stupid. It's not <laughs> professional to me. But... Um, I actually, you know, the kit is so close to the FC Dallas kit that it's like, you could be like, oh, this is the FC Dallas kit that's coming in two years. You'd be like, oh, yeah, it totally makes sense. I mean, I that's something I'm sure you're going to want to talk about, Peter, is how, why is it so similar to FC Dallas all of a sudden? Like, in and of itself, I think, you know, its imitation of FC Dallas is really good. It's really on par. It's really on brand, if that's your intention. intention. I, of course, would like white shorts with it because that would set off that blue top, that dark blue and red top even more so. But it's not bad with dark shorts. So overall, for me, it's actually a pretty good kit if it's doing what you intended to do. Other than the font, I think it's really good. Well, the font's league-wide, so they probably have no little no, yeah, to they have say no shorts, that, yeah. right? So at least they pick, you know, contrasting uh, uh, white to do that. Yeah, I, I, I think the shirt in it to itself is fine. I'm just utterly confused as to what the branding strategy for this club is. 
Um, it makes no sense to me, and I and I can't figure out where in the process of making the decision to choose this shirt, somebody didn't like. Like I'm assuming at some point somebody must have said inside the club, oh, this is really cool. Oh, wait a second. It From a distance, it looks almost exactly like our new FC Dallas shirt we're going to be debuting a few weeks prior to this one. And, yeah. I, like, and if that conversation did have happen, is this a indication of a larger change that is forthcoming? Because I yeah. look at this and I begin to wonder – with other MLS clubs uh, vacating their, you know, specialized names they came up with for their, you know, USL one or USL team that are moving to MLS next. I just wonder if this isn't a forebearer of, uh, well, let me just say it. Like I told it to you the other day, this, this smells like FC Dallas junior playing at the Dr. Pink field yeah. in 2023. Yeah. Well, not specifically, as we mentioned, the Dr. Pink feels too small, but you know, the, um, it is today. Yeah. That's a, it's a, it's a legitimate question. The original foundation of this franchise, North Texas, that soccer club specifically, and mind you is what we're talking about here. The idea was that the brand would be separate and different because they wanted to establish it in the Western half of the city as a brand on its own. The city being DFW, the Metroplex. Now, if, if that's your intention, this is a giant misfire from that. Cause you know, the, the what's the thing that I smash about the club on about kits over and over and over consistency. again consistency of branding particularly your new home kit you can you can mess around with the road kits have a couple of different ones you like or whatever third kits go crazy but the first kit when people see it they should be able to go oh i know what that is yankee pinstripe cowboys home whites manchester united red with the white shorts and the black real madrid white you can just all the great brands in the world have a consistency of branding to them Real Madrid has a hundred years of white shirts. You can sell a white shirt, right? So the, once you'd established North Texas soccer club as a red Jersey with white shorts and red socks, that should have been it. They should have stuck with that forever. And so three seasons in that's gone out the window. So why would you do that? Either you don't understand branding of jerseys and kits ding, ding, entirely ding. possible, or <laughs> you're trying to swing back to be, an imitator of FC Dallas. Now you mentioned the other teams that have lost their developmental names. What I understand about that is that most of them that have done that have given up on that, had trouble selling that name. People didn't understand what it was. Didn't get it. You know, like the broader audience. Now I like the alternative name personally. I think it's cool. I think the idea that you have a reserve or they don't even like the name reserve that you have a developmental squad that plays under a different name in a different league is cool. I, I would have preferred to stay in USL one, quite frankly, rather than being in next pro where, which is going to dilute into nothing. I'm afraid I'm panicking about that. So I, I don't, I'm with you, Peter. I, it's mystifying on those lines. It makes me feel like someone's not paying attention. Uh, whoever picked those jerseys right in and of themselves. They're nice. I like them. But not in the big picture, I don't. Yeah, it's just it's just really oddly confusing, and it doesn't make any sense. And and it was one of those deals where if there was some sort of explanation, because they went through such efforts to try to tell everybody on the onset of this deal why they were giving it a different name, why they were having different kits, why they were playing in a place other than Frisco, it was all to build this new separate thing, and now suddenly it doesn't feel like that. And if there was some sort of logical explanation, if they'd just be transparent about it, um, and because I'm not sure there is, it may be just as simple as nobody thought about it. You know, they just liked this particular shirt and they decided to put blue shorts with it. And nobody th yeah. put two and two together that it looks exactly like the new shirt that they just introduced. I don't know. It's uh, and, I you almost know, guarantee you that's it. Yeah. Yeah, probably. Right. I mean, you know, remember how the crest was designed. So, you know, right. not, not a ton <laughs> of thought is put into this stuff. So it is what it is. Um, and it, and, it, and, you know, for anybody frustrated by this conversation, I admit this is a really minor thing to be spending 15 minutes on on the podcast. It just is confusing. And I was confused it, by it. It's confusing, Peter, because, I mean, listen, I bought it. I think it's a good looking kit. What I'm saying is that for all the changes around here this winter, as, as excited as I am about all the things in the, in the whole entire organization that I think I've turned a corner and are now going in a good direction, 
then you stumble and chip over your own feet with something like this and waste yeah. whatever branding. Granted, you didn't have a lot of branding, but you had some. And now it's you've diluted that branding. You've diluted the idea that you're creating an independent brand and trying to sell tickets. By the way, triple the best crowd I've ever seen at a North Texas game on opening day. I don't care whether it was the free tickets or the, you know, I've long said that the tickets to that thing should be five bucks and that should be the way you for not 20 bucks like they are, I think, advertised. So, you know, to, to see a stumble like this is particularly frustrating when so much else had been going the right direction. Right. Well, that's a lot of talk about a silly shirt, not any talk about the actual game that they won. Yeah. Dan, you want to go? Did you watch the game? I actually only caught the last 20 minutes, so I got to see the Tariq Scott show, but uh, unfortunately missed the, the, uh, the opening act. Okay, well, I'll give you the bullet points for me. Tariq Scott, obviously, if you guys have read my work, you guys being the audience, you'll know that name. It's, he's been on my homegrown uh, target list for the last year, maybe year and a half. He's a guy that's long had a lot of ability and sort of put it all together last season when he was a U-17. It was his first season as a U-17. Uh, and he finally took off around the playoffs and he led the uh, playoffs. He was the golden boot winner for the playoffs. So that was basically uh, seven months ago-ish that that happened. And that's when a lot of people first heard about him. And this year he's playing as a U-19 mostly, even though he's one of the technically U-17 by age. So I'm not surprised at all he's a guy that's in the mix for that team. I'm not surprised at all that he got into the game and had the ability to score a couple of goals. They're not exactly crackers of goals, but they're goals, and he rose to the occasion. And he's literally 15 or 16-ish. I don't know exactly which one he is. So that's that's always really exciting. Uh, bullet point number two is the actual man of the match, you know, Academy kid scoring two goals aside, which gets you the real the award. The, the guy that really was the underpinning of the whole thing is Blaine Ferry is phenomenal. He actually is playing as a six, a holding mid for them. I have no idea why. My guess is because of what's going to be topic number four in this thing. Blaine was amazing. He's been amazing all spring. I don't know why he's not with FC Dallas. It's mystifying. The kid's playing out of his mind. Uh, Antonio Carrera in goal had six saves. Honestly, it probably was actually more like 12 he bailed out his team time and time and time again, had multiple double saves go off in that game. He kept them in it when they could, they should have been down three, one instead it was one, one until Scott could score those couple of goals. So that was nice. And the other big takeaway is that again, the defense is not very good. And in particular, the center backs were really, really rough. One of them is the 18 year old kid that came down from Pacific that is basically one of the diamond in the rough finds by this coach, by uh, Coach Ka that he brought with him, basically. And the kid played one game before this <laughs> in his pro career. Uh, wow. And the other one is Chase Nice, who's the one of their third-round draft picks, so not a lot of high expectations there. So you can see why perhaps, even aside from the fact that Bartlett needs minutes, it's maybe not a shock that Bartlett's going to come down and play because the center backs were really, really poor most of the game. Granted, they're both project players. And I think that's why Blaine is playing as a six because he's the best passer and connector on the team. And when you can't pass out of the back and can't build out of the back, he's back there to try and bring the ball out and get the ball moving forward. That's my guess. I didn't get a chance to ask about that yet. So there's my breakdown of the North Texas game. Uh, All right. I probably should go see one of those games at some point. but hmm, Dude, you should. It's fantastic. I need to get to one as well, but it's just – it's all the way over there. Dude, it's like two blocks away. What are you talking about? It's right over here by my house. Yeah, yeah, but you live <laughs> all the way over there. <laughs> you can walk. It's like a mile. Come park in my driveway. Yeah, can we uh, can we uh, sleep? We can sleep over so we don't have fun. Yeah, yeah. So we, we don't have to hustle all the way back to Dallas in the middle of the night? Okay. Oh. Uh, now you know what it's like for me stuff. going to Frisco. <laughs> all right, now, all right. We're gonna end the pod with the Buzz getting to tell a story. Because, oh my gosh, Buzz! You told me this story earlier this week, and this yeah. is one of my favorite stories I've heard out of you. This is so good. So, if you're listening to the pod and you're doing and you're like casually listening in the background while you do dishes or work on an important work paper or do something else, stop, stop what you're doing and just 
if especially if you're a fan of this club, FC Dallas, and you love it when you get to hear your club get one over on some snotty upstart, <laughs> this yeah. is the story for you. Buzz, please. Yeah. Okay, so I have to put a tiny bit of context on the whole thing so that you'll understand how it works. Uh, right now, the as we've demonstrated earlier in the pod, the 2003 class has been already been gutted by pros, and 2004 was really empty. You know, all of which means that the U19 team only has a few players, a handful of players, maybe like seven players that are of the actual correct age group for the U19s. So Dallas, as a consequence, they have a really loaded 2005 and 2006 classes, which both should be in the U17s. Well, because they have too many players there, they took literally they have 12 players from the 2005s that play up with the U19 team, basically. So effectively... Dallas plays a U17 team in the U19 bracket, and they play a U16 team in the U17 bracket. That's very typical of how this club wants to operate anyway. They want to play against tougher competition. And that's important to understand because last October, when they went up to St. Louis at City, St. Louis City Soccer Club, to play them in an academy game, Dallas at the time, was had a, their 17s was very 16 U16 oriented. You're talking about 15 year old kids mostly. And they had a couple injuries and they were missing a couple of guys. So it was a mediocre version of that team to say the least. And they went up to St. Louis, hard to play on the road, hard to play when you're Wait, traveling. Hold on. And, and, and let's put some context for those who don't understand the situation in St. Louis. Yeah. This is one of the next MLS teams. They're, there appears to be lots of stories about how well organized and how correctly they're doing this process. And St. Louis as a city is legendary uh, in the long-term history of the sport in our country. Like St. Louis really is a center point of soccer in the United yeah. States. So they are hungry and eager. And if you think Austin fans think they invented soccer, oh, St. Yeah. Louis fans really think it, and they may actually have some <laughs> ownership yeah. of it to a certain degree. Yeah, they certainly do with the 19- the World Cup team, for sure. Uh, so the point of that, is, as you say, Peter, is that they don't have an MLS team, but they have a MLS Next Pro team, and they have multiple academy teams already. So Dallas goes up there with their somewhat depleted U16 team to play in the U17 game. And a couple of guys don't have great games, and they end up losing 4-2. to two. That's how this goes, right? You, you, you play who you brought. If you're missing guys, if you're hurt, if you don't bring your best team and you lose, no big deal, right? You lose 4-2. to two. Well, here's the thing. At the end of that game, a bunch of, and how many it is, I don't know, and I even heard about it at the time, a bunch of their parents and players start, started taking pictures of the scoreboard, and there was a lot of talk in various circles of, oh, we've made it, we beat the mighty FC Dallas, we're going to be great, St. Louis all the way. So you can imagine that that didn't go over very well with a bunch of kids for sure. And maybe I'm going to guess even the coaching staff because and the parents and the parents. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I heard about it back in October. I mean, I knew that's how big a deal it was. They were pissed to be blunt. You poked so, the bear. Yeah. You, you poked the bear. So this last weekend, they St. Louis now has to come down here and play. And let me just say that the lineup that the FC Dallas rolled out in this game was what I would call a mess around and find out lineup because they <laughs> brought down they brought down two or three of the guys that are U15s and they they basically stacked the team with an actual U17 team. The only players they were missing was are two injured guys, which is Diego Hernandez who technically is a U17 even though he's the best player in the academy. Julian Eisen the 66 keeper, but as I just said, they have another U19 keeper who's actually U17 eligible that's been in first team training. So they played him. He's perfectly good, you know, and they didn't have, you know, maybe, oh, Anthony Ramirez, who's the Mexican kid who gets all the caps all the time with their national teams. He was on the bench. So other than that, it's about as good as a starting as 11 as you could possibly roll out with the U17 team. And they did not take it easy. Like they rolled up a score line of 14 to zero and you would think like i'm pissed off maybe like at six or seven you're like that's enough no i'm not Mercy. saying they ran up the score but look at that score and they ran up the damn uh, score yeah they yeah. ran up the score i know nobody probably oh. wants to admit that publicly but yeah 
if you decide to push it to double digits and you don't stop at 11, <laughs> yeah, you are definitely running up the score. Yeah, anything over and, double digits is a run-up score, and guys are coming off the benches, bench and scoring. Two guys had braces off the bench. You know what I mean? It's like you're bringing on national team players and guys that started for North Texas, that played for North Texas the night before are, are starting and scoring braces, and guys that have been in first-team training are starting. I mean, like literally, it was like – FC Dallas got tired of everybody saying that they don't win anymore or something. And we're like, Oh really? Okay. And they, <laughs> and, cause that the U 17 team has got these two loaded classes in it. So they loaded up and just blew them out, you know? And once it goes South, it continues to go South, you know, and they, for sportsmanship, they probably should have lifted the pedal, but you know, everybody that's an FC Dallas fan is probably really happy. They didn't just to prove a point, you know, and this yes. is a greater point. Peter, that we've I've been saying for a long time because people talk about how Dallas's academy doesn't really win anymore, and I'm like, dude, that's not how it works. That's not the point. I mean, yes, they try to win games, but there was there's five or six guys that are now with North Texas full time. Literally, the 19 team is mostly U17s. Literally, the U17 team is mostly 14 year old kids from 2006. You know, they move people up and up and up and up. It's not about if they wanted to only win U17 games that team would just be stacked to the wazoo and they would yeah. win every game 10 nothing all season long but what good does that do that doesn't develop professionals which is the no, point no it yeah. doesn't develop the professionals and it also doesn't help those kids that aren't going to be professionals uh, get division yeah. 1 college scholarships and yeah. and i and you know i've never done this math and i don't know if anybody has but it, i would be willing to bet dallas not only leads in the number of players they've sold internationally but the number of kids that they have sold or not sold or helped get signed to d1 uh, uh, scholarships. Yeah. Well, there's I'm a sure reason a- why they're, they're the only club in their U19 bracket that still has a U19 team from MLS. Everybody else has gotten rid of it except for FC Dallas. And the reason they don't is because they want to make sure that they are loyal to all the kids that form the bulk of the academy all the way up. You only get a couple of pros. So priority number one is the couple of pros. Priority number two is as many kids to the highest level of college play as you can possibly get. That's why they maintain a U19 team and, and will continue. I am told flat out will continue to have a U19 team going forward for that very reason. And then winning stuff is really, really the third level. Yes, you want to win. Yes, you try to win. Yes, you try to compete. But that's the third most important thing, honestly, for that organization. And I think it's actually really great that that is the way it is. Well, my favorite part of that uh, story, other than just revenge and setting the record straight, was uh, a couple days later after you tweeted that result, there was a quote tweet from, I think it's a relatively well-noted or maybe like somebody that a fan blog of the St. Louis Club that (laughs) that quote tweeted with, oh God, please tell me this isn't true. Yeah, yeah. That's (laughs) when I saw the lineup, I was like, oh dear. (laughs) I mean, because honestly, it was like, oh, okay, you can take pictures of the scoreboard, are you? Here we go. You got you, yeah. your kids got spanked fourteen to nothing. <laughs> hope you learned your lesson. There you yeah. go. All right. Welcome to Dallas. I hope everybody enjoyed that story as much as I did. Dan, did you enjoy that story? I enjoyed it uh, almost as much as a good U.S. Open Cup tie. Mm. Yeah, we didn't get passionate, enthusiastic Dan tonight in this pod because we didn't have U.S. Open Cup talk. Is there anything U.S. Open Cup related you'd like to throw in here just to see if we can get you going? No. Okay. All right. That's disappointing. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's some stories from it, but nothing that's related to uh, DFW, so no. No, we did. You know, you told those two good stories about what happened in other games, and we saw that the uh, Motown got their uh, appeal granted for the uh, was oh, that the head injury? Now, yeah. Oh, the replay. Yeah, they, that's what it was. Oh, so I saw a funny thing. Um, it, the last time someone was successful in getting a replay, it was uh, a team that lost to the Richmond Kickers in 1995 in the first round. They lost five two. And very much like Buzzy St. Louis story, they were like, "Yeah, yeah, we're gonna, we because uh, they, they complained they only had a couple of days to prepare." So like, "Yeah, now we're really prepared. We're gonna destroy them." They lost six one. Richmond <laughs> went on to win the Open Cup. Yeah, that's that Richmond team was really good. I think that Richmond had a, uh, Peter. You remember this name, Rob Ucrop? Do you remember that name? Oh yeah, I do. Yeah, yeah. like the, the 1995. Uh, U.S. Open Cup final is a fascinating study. It's on YouTube. It's between El Paso Patriots and the Richmond Kickers. 
And I think if you're a legitimate soccer aficionado in this country, you should watch it because that's the year before MLS. And so it's a phenomenal case study for, for the semi-pro nature of soccer in this country at that phase before MLS came in. So I think it's a really a landmark game and one worth watching if you want to educate yourself. By the way, yeah, that's a that's a great ahead. suggestion. No, yeah. no, no. I was just saying that's a great suggestion because you know so many people don't remember what an absolute desert yeah. this country was prior to you know ninety six and the start that, of MLS. That game was on like Fox Sports regionals, and like Ty Keo did the game. It's a full blown legit professional production, so it's not like watching somebody's handy cam. It's a legitimate game feed. And it's an enjoyable game from understanding the context. So I, I recommend it. It's out there on the web for sure because I actually sat down and watched it for that very reason. And by the way, DKSC plays Tuesday at, at San Antonio. I mean, that literally is right around the corner. You don't think of it as being that close, but it's you know less than a week away for their second game. We, we need to do a, an off-season pod on the Richardson Rockets and Dallas Romer at some point. Yeah, Dallas Romer story I know, Richardson Rocket story I do not. Yeah, I don't. I mean, I'm familiar with the name and I kind of remember, but uh, yeah, that would be a good one to revisit. The Roma one was good. I, in fact, I know several of the Roma guys that played on that team, and uh, hearing them tell stories about it is pretty fantastic. So uh, those were those were good days. Um, all right. Well, uh, anything else, Buzz or Dan, you'd like to throw in here in this episode of the podcast? Going once. I, I would like to mention that Nanu does not have a left foot. He basically stands on one foot and kicks with that same foot and hops up and down the field. <laughs> I just want to. I just want to make sure everybody's aware that the the current state of Nanu isn't going very well on this particular podcast, and I think we all should be prepared for maybe <laughs> for an inevitable ending to this relationship. You watch his footage, like from Portugal, and he was like banging crosses off his left he was you know even his play just kind of seemed like something that would suit fc dallas better than he is right now well maybe the concussion was worse than we knew i don't want to give up on him like we did on cobra and then cobra turned it around so it's possible he's going to turn around but you know i watched him in training go down in the scrimmage game, go down the right side all the time. And a couple of times he would cut back to the middle and there's a perfect shot or swing or splitting pass available for the left foot. And he would line it up and be like, uh, no, I'm not. And then he would try and do something with his right foot and it would be like turning back or be like, he bailed out on using the left. And I'm like, well, that's not good. That's you know, good. so uh, listen, I, I give the guy the effort points from last game. I'm, I'm keeping an open mind. You know, he's fine. He's not horrible. But I'm not I'm not buying it all yet. Me? Are you telling me you haven't gone out and bought your rainbow colored suspenders yet? No, I'm waiting for somebody to actually wear them to a game so I can all get right. a pick or something. You know, he's gonna right. he's gonna pair him up with his North Texas SC Dallas two juniors jersey. I did order one of those. If they were gonna rename North Texas something related to FC Dallas, uh, uh, what? Do we have a consensus on what we think is the best? Is it FCD2, FCD Juniors, FCD Rugrats? What is it? Well, no one's ever going to convince me that they didn't try and name it FC Texas and that that's how they ended up with North Texas. I'm 100% convinced that that story is true, even though I made it up. I think uh, (laughs) the the Football Manager games only just caught up this year uh, to where FC Dallas Juniors is no longer the reserve team for FC Dallas. Wow. Hmm. I'd love I think FCD Juniors would be cool. I actually like that quite a bit. Well, you remember that's what they initially named the academy. Well, the youth club was well, at first it was yeah. FC Texas and that didn't go. And then it was going to be FC yeah. Juniors and that lasted like 6 months and then it's just the FC Dallas Academy. So I don't know what happened to all that stuff. I wasn't privy to those discussions why it changed like three times, but there's pictures of those kids wearing those FC Texas shirts at the yeah. groundbreaking, you remember? Yeah, I do. Actually, I'm taking back my vote uh, on FCD Juniors. I'm taking it back because I forgot what I really want it to be is Lil FCD. L-I-L apostrophe. Lil FCD. That's what I want, and I hope that happens. Can we start that hashtag? I'm going to go for FCD Jung. That's my vote. Apparently, that's what the Dutch teams all call, right? IX Jung and PSV Jung or whatever. You're such a Euro FC kiddos. Yeah. FC (laughs) kiddos. 
Excellent. All right. So, Dan, do you have anything you'd like to throw in here? Because I'm ready to go look and see what the lineup for tonight is for the U.S. No, I'm ready. I could get my dinner. Okay, go get your dinner. Uh, thank you, Dan. You were highly, uh, uh, you're much loved. Th- thank you. I greatly appreciate that. This is a very emotional moment. I hope everyone uh, appreciates the, the emotion and the tears that are flowing currently. <laughs> All right. Uh, Buzz, thank you for all the extra uh, non-week insight, and we look forward to uh, another game this Saturday for the mighty FC Dallas. Yeah, sorry for the imbalance. Obviously, it leaned into stuff that I went to, and the game there was no game for Dan to watch. So, sorry. Hey, man, you're putting in the work. That's all, that's all anybody cares about. Yeah, I try. I try to put in the work. Uh, Dan and I are only here for kind of color and decoration. You're here what everybody comes for. This is the Buzz Carrick podcast, really, and you just have to realize that. I know you say that, but like I, I've tried to do it by myself, and it's really hard. It sucks <laughs> it's because I'm not good at it without you guys. No, that's okay. That's what we're I think here it's for, way man. better when both you guys are here. Yeah. Conversations are fun. Absolutely. This is Alex Aaron again, reminding you that the Third Degree Podcast is brought to you by Soccer 90. Your source for FC Dallas, U.S. national team, and international club gear. Located in Frisco at Toyota Stadium, stop in and shop their wide variety of jerseys, scarves, and soccer equipment. North Texas SC has kicked off a new season, and the new home jersey is on sale now exclusively on Soccer90.com. Prior to yours while supplies last. Third Degree listeners receive 20% off your order when you use promo code Third Degree at checkout. Promo code good online only. Some exclusions may apply. All right. Yeah. Well, we'll finish it up there. Uh, let's go USA. Let's get to, to Cutter knocked out tonight. Uh, and we'll look forward to that. Enjoy the game on Saturday and we will speak to you next week. Oh, by the way, thank you, Pappy Check, for the music. We'll speak to you next week on another episode of Third Degree, the podcast. Qualify, please. Third Degree, the Third Degree Net Podcast. Third Degree. The green air pocket. The green air pocket. The green air pocket. The green air pocket. The green air pocket.